Good afternoon. This talk is called Why Should We Listen to Our Elders and Eat Our Mud? And I hope the meaning will become clear. But first, let me open this talk with this quote from Albert Einstein. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. My name is Carolina Londoño. I'm a student here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and I'm a geologist, but one day I hope I'll be a good ethnogeologist. And you may be wondering what ethnogeology is, and we'll get there, but let me start with some examples first. Here in this picture, I'm showing you the elder uh, Vicente Macuritofe. He was a very knowledgeable Witoto man. The Witoto live in the Colombian Amazon rainforest around this area. So here in this picture, Vicente is showing a, a piece of clay that they use for different healing purposes, like treating digestive disorders. They actually know about different clays that can be used to treat different ailments. And not only clays, they also use rocks and soils, and they have ideas of how different landscape features form, and they have observed different uh, natural uh, processes. So the Witoto have, a, have an understanding of geology. But healing place is not a part of classic geology. So by bringing this knowledge, we can improve and enrich our science. Another interesting method of, of ethnogeology is collecting stories. So as an example, I'm bringing you the story of the Amazon River. And first I'm going to tell you the rational mind story, that the one that you can find in books. And this is a story, a story that started like around 15 million years ago when the western Amazon basin was all flooded. So here we can see a big lake and a connection to the ocean towards the north. There was no river, there was no rainforest, and to the west, the Andes were not at their present height. There was a barrier here, but they were just uplifting. And actually, the history of the Amazon River is connected to this uplift of the Andes. And to your right, you can see an impression of how things may have looked like. All swampy, different species, and a lot of water. Then what happened is that as the mountain uh, rose, the drainage became rearranged. All the land became dried, and there was a connection now towards the east. So the Paleo-Amazon started to flow in that direction until we get the, what we have today, this network, this network uh, connection of the present and the present configuration of the area. So this is uh, the rational mind story. But if you ask the people that have been living for thousands of years in the forest, what's the, their version of the born of the Amazon River, then they have another, another uh, story. This is known as the Monilla Mena, or the Tree of Abundance. And this is the story of a tree that was the son of a water being. At its base, the tree had a, a pond that continued to grow as the tree also grew. And this tree, what is special about it is it was holding the foods for the people. And the people back then were the animals. So they were uh, being nurtured by this tree. But this tree, it, it was the son of a god. So it continued to grow and grow and grow. And the water at its base was also extending and becoming more and more flooded. So at some point, it was so tall that not even the bird people were able to catch the fruits and the animals in the land were not able to swim across and get to its base. So they had to do something about it. And then, then they decided to chop down the tree. So they chopped down the tree, and as the tree fell, then the trunk became the Amazon River. And the big branches, the main tributaries, and then the small twigs became the creeks. But not only that, also the foods and the fruits of the tree became fish and animals in the water, and the leaves became the forests. So not only the Amazon River, but the whole rainforest is explained in this myth. And then you can start to see how they we thought to see the forest as a mega organism. Let's explore a little bit this second story. The tree here is an organizing principle. 
one that establishes connections and relationships between the water, the fish, and the forests. It is like an ecological story. So this story is part to, uh, of what has been called native science. And in native science, the models are more holistic, metaphoric, and symbolic, and they establish different relationships. So that's part of the intuitive mind of looking at nature. Then the first story that I told you about, that I talked to you about, is the Western science story. It's more reductionist. It's just the river and the mountain. Mechanistic, it's concerned with the accuracy and linearity of the details. And it's more discipline-based, like this is the geologic part. Then if you want to look into the species, then you have to go to biology, right? So that's a complementary vision. So I will argue that these two stories are complementary, that they can coexist, and that they can help us understand better the Earth, which is uh, the objective of geology. They are both rooted in the physical world, and they are better communicated in the language of each culture. So this brings us to the point that science is an expression of a culture. It's an expression of a way a human group relates to nature. So what is ethnogeology? Finally, we get here to this question. Ethnogeology is studying the earth and its materials, but integrating other perceptions, considering other views. So I like to think of it as exchanging notes with other students. But in this case, these students are from different cultures. So we need to be aware of these differences that we may have different ways to communicate the same thing, we may have different ideas of what to do with this knowledge or why is this good for. So um, that's why we bring ethnography. And we also have to make sure that we establish a platform so it is fair to share. And so we both can benefit from this exchanging, exchange. And why is this important? Well, first of all, this can improve our science. This can open new cognitive spaces and research areas, like the example I was telling you about from healing clays. We can also review and rethink our models, our taxonomies, and even our paradigms. And we can access historical information that may not be available in the rock record or even in the scientific record, because science is fairly new. So for example, if we are talking about climate, Maybe that's not in the rocks, but it may be alive in the memories of the people that have inhabited an area for thousands of years. So we could use that information to inform our models. Also, usually in stories, there might be accounts of geologic events like volcanoes exploding or floods, some things that otherwise we would have never known. And also, the ethnogeology can improve the contribution of science in current pressing issues like global warming, like environmental degradation, or overuse of resources. So take home message, ethnogeology can contribute intellectually and philosophically to mainstream science. But this is not only one way. Indigenous communities can also benefit from ethnogeology. Um, Indigenous knowledge is concerned uh, most of the time with what is on the surface. But geology has powerful tools to find out what's underneath. And this could be underground water or mineral resources or even geologic hazards. So if we do studies for the communities and we tell them what's beneath their soil, beneath their ground, then they may, they may be empowered to better negotiate their resources or to make a better use of them, too. Also, we have uh, remote sensing data that can give us information on a global basis, and this information can be used by native people, too. Uh, there's been research on indigenous knowledge for environmental sustainability. Um, basically, it can be resuming indigenous people have a broad knowledge of how to live sustainable. They have inhabited this area for thousands of years, 
and they have done so in a way that doesn't affect their environment. So we can uh, maybe take some of their ideas of how to live sustainable. Also, indigenous knowledge is concerned with proper behavior. It has moral and values ingrained on them. So these are things that we can incorporate in our science too. For example, don't take more than what you need. That's a sustainable principle. And last, I'm going to argue that scientific knowledge on its own has been incapable of responding adequately to environmental degradation. So that's one more thing of why we need to hear other experiences. But also in the social sphere, ethnogeology can have an impact. So ethnogeology has been proven uh, to be useful to uh, address the underrepresentation of Aboriginal people in science. If we incorporate indigenous knowledge in a curricula of a, of a local school, for instance, where there is native people, they can feel it relates to them. They can get a better um, cultural appreciation for their landscape and for their culture. And they may be encouraged to pursue a career in geoscience, for example. And that makes a difference because then the indigenous people will be able to, um, to get a better job, better paid, and also help their community, bringing all their knowledge hand in hand with the technological advance and all the uh, geological knowledge. So this has been studied, for instance, Stephen Semkin here at ASU. He has done a lot of work on how to uh, use ethnogeology in curricula, and he has found that uh, ethnogeology can enhance native students' abilities to do science, foster cultural appreciation, and stewardship for their lands. And then if I didn't convince you that these are good reasons to pursue ethnogeology, then I want you to consider this. What does it mean that science that claims to be objective and that claims to be the best that we have is not integrating and is not considering and even more undermining other sources of knowledge. Like to put it roughly, as Shiva said, how can modern science be regarded as signaling advance for humanity if it is achieved at the cost of tremendous silencing and dead deterioration in social status of most humanity? including women and non-Western cultures. Somehow, it seems wrong not to hear other people. So to close, I just want to say, it is time to give the intuitive mind its place back. Thank you.